All right, so in this video, I have something really exciting to share with you guys. It's a brand new function from my lab that covers different types of effect sizes. Um, and so uh, if you've used Moat from our lab before, you know it helps you calculate Cohen's D effect sizes and their confidence intervals. And we've been working with Moat to be able to um, calculate effect size confidence intervals for other things like uh, eta squared and omega and um, chi square, some other functions, but we ran into a snag mathematically that it just was timing out and having some problems calculating in an efficient way. Um, so I've made the switch to R and I found someone had written some code for non-central distributions in R Thank you, whoever wrote those. So I uh, pulled it from a wiki site that I have linked in the code. Uh, and the rest I put together to calculate all kinds of different effect sizes and their confidence intervals uh, with fairly good uh, efficient provision, pro, uh, proficiency. Um, so what you would download is two different scripts because it's much easier if you separate them. The first one is F size. That's actually another package um, that will calculate at least effect sizes for you, but um, it just made sense to me to call it that. And so what this does is it has all of the source code. If you want to look at it, the functions that I've written, um, any comments, questions, or corrections are greatly appreciated. And um, it calculates the non-central distributions and then some APA style formatting. So if you use a different type of formatting, you can change that section to fit your needs. Um, and then what I've programmed is a bunch of different types of sizes. So I uh, have them all in this calculate function uh, script. And so what's in the calculate script is the first thing it does is it sources that file. Um, it's very similar to the library command, except this is not a package, just some scripts. So that will open when you run that all of the different functions that are programmed to uh, make all this uh, action happen down here. So all of this over here is what you can use to calculate these different pieces and then some extra ones that do some of the dirty work in the background like these NCPs, calculate the non-centrality parameter or how different from normal it is. So what you would do here is pick your um, type of test. Right now, these are all set up to calculate directly from means and standard deviations when appropriate, uh, except ADA. At some point in the near future, I'll have ones that can calculate from T as well. Um, you will always get more precision if you calculate directly from the source statistics. However, I know if you're working on a meta-analysis, you don't always see those numbers in the papers that are published. Uh, and so we're working on those functions. Um, but primarily this was for a class, so I just pulled it uh, straight from um, numbers that you would usually have on hand. So let me walk through each one of these. So a single sample t-test here. Um, what you would do is on all these pieces, you have to fill in some sort of number. They do have defaults, but more than likely you shouldn't use the defaults. So um, what you want to do is change the m. So m here is sample mean. Uh, and I'll write these out here. So we got m hit sample mean. Oops. Right. From your uh, statistics. The U or mu is the population mean that you're estimating from. SD is your standard deviation of the sample. Okay, so if you have standard error, you should calculate backwards first. In here is your sample size. At A is alpha or your type one error rate. Or usually we talk about this being P less than 0.05, that sort of thing. And K is the number of decimals that you'd like to see. Okay. Oops, decimals. So I'm actually going to move these real quick um, here because this will be true across all these different statistics. So I could change these. I could say I'm going to do 10 compared to... Um, let's say seven, we've got a standard deviation of four, and my sample size is 20. So when you run this, what you're going to see is that it will give you the mean here, standard deviation, uh, standard error, so it's calculating the standard deviation divided by the square root of n, the 95% confidence interval from the mean, so why 95%? Well, that's because alpha I set to 0.05, 
If I change that to 0.10, it will then give me a 90% confidence interval. Okay, so that is determined by the alpha. Gives me my T value with degrees of freedom. If it's significant, okay, the uh, effect size, which is Cohen's D here, and the confidence interval for the effect size. So I would say this effect size ranges from small to large using the traditional criteria. Um, now I did get a warning that the uh, non-centrality parameter had some issues that will happen every once in a while. It's just a warning. It does not mean that it's failed. Uh, and that generally is an issue with um, converging on the exact points to calculate these confidence intervals with. Um, they're usually fairly accurate, but um, you will get a warning every once in a while because it isn't uh, perfectly precise. Uh, but the thing to take with a grain of salt then is the confidence interval here. The rest of the numbers should be correct. Um, and that'll often happen as T is very large. So large T values tend to kind of freak it out. So let's say we made this um, where the mu was something even closer. So 12 here. Okay. Um, because T was a little bit smaller, it sort of settled better. <clears throat> Uh, if I wanted to get three decimals or even 10, if I wanted, um, I just change K here and that'll change the number of decimal points that I see. So for dependent T, <clears throat> what we have to do for the average statistic is what will happen is this will calculate dependent T with the average standard deviations on the bottom instead of standard deviation of the differences. And so I need mean one, mean two, Standard deviation one, standard deviation two. There's only one n because this is dependent t. And so there's only one group. They're just tested twice. Alpha, which we already talked about, and decimals. And what that will give you is each mean separately with their standard errors and confidence interval for that mean. Uh, and then d and the confidence interval for d. Now it has a little warning, not a warning, a note here that says t and p is not reported. So dependent T averages is not the way that D, uh, I'm sorry, um, dependent T is traditionally calculated. And so I can't quite calculate T for you because I don't have the right numbers in this formula. So it tells you, um, I'm not going to show you T and P that I calculated in the background for this because they're not correct for hypothesis testing. And it's just because they're not the same formula. So dependent T averages is a new version of, um, of Cohen C that essentially treats it as if it's an independent T to average the standard deviations on the bottom so that we're not overestimating um, our effect size. And if you want a really good explanation of why that's a good thing, I highly recommend reading some of Jeff Cummings' work who um, really points it out quite plainly why, why that is a better idea to underestimate rather than over. But if you want to go with the traditional formula for uh, D in repeated measures designs, you could use this dependent T differences one. So you would enter the mean difference, the standard deviation of the different scores. So that's the standard deviation of the uh, time one minus time two or group one minus group two in alpha and um, K. So let me add up here. So we got M diff equals mean difference score. And then SD diff equals the standard deviation of the different scores. Okay. And that is different from the standard deviation of a sample. Right. So we run that one. Uh, so, I, so I got my same warning because T is so large, 7.91. Um, and so if I put, maybe make the standard deviation a little larger here, um, I get less errors. Um, so that gives me my mean difference score, my standard deviation of the different scores, my standard error of the different scores, uh, the confidence interval of the mean, T, P, and uh, Cohen's D, and then the confidence interval for Cohen's D. All right, so the next one now is independent T. So you got mean one, mean two, standard deviation one and two, and one and two. So there's there's two totally separate groups. So you have to enter all of those numbers for this to work accurately. But then alpha and K are the same. So just make sure you enter all of mean group one's information in order. And because I'm using this little code, you could enter mean one, comma, SD one, comma. So they don't quite have to go in this order, but you do have to enter them all um, to get the right numbers here. 
So when you run that one, it gives you mean, standard deviation, standard error of each group and their confidence intervals, and your t value and its p value, Cohen's d, and the confidence interval for Cohen's d. Um, there are two other versions of independent t. There's Hedges g, so it will give you g instead of d, and Glass's delta, um, which will calculate with the standard deviation of the control group as the denominator. And so be sure you enter your control group first. So that's kind of a warning I need here. The control group is M1 okay, and SD1. Otherwise, that will change your answers. Um, because instead of having standard error, uh, pooled standard deviation on the bottom, which is part of uh, D for T and um, G for T, it instead has just the control group standard deviation on the bottom. So this is for a very traditional control versus experimental design. Okay. But otherwise the numbers are um, the same points. So control group, experimental group, standard deviations in. And then the output looks roughly the same. Now for chi-square, <clears throat> we're going to calculate Kramer's V or phi. Uh, and so you're going to enter chi-square Okay, so the don't square it, it's just the, the output you get from your chi-square analysis. So enter chi-square. N, this is the total sample size. How many people are in your study? R is the number of rows in your design. C is the number of columns. So let me add those up here. So we got x equals chi-square value. Um, we already talked about N, so row, oops, R equals number of rows in chi-square, c equals number of columns. So if you have a 2 by 2, um, you would enter 2 comma 2. Where are we at? Here. So alpha and k again. And this one I'll just give you one line because there's no summary statistic like the mean that you would present a contingency table or frequency table for. Um, so I got chi-square, so you would have to fix the little uh, superscript 2, but uh, chi-square was 10, p, that is significant, um, Kramer's v, and then the confidence interval for v. Next thing down, I have odds ratios or sensitivity and specificity uh, calculations. Now the way that this one works is that you can't actually have already have the odds ratio for this calculation. You have to have the original square. Um, and so the way this happens, and I'll just draw it out for you, it's a little easier to process and visually, is I would end up with a 2 by 2 table, so very specific, only for 2 by 2s, um, where I have, uh, you know, affect uh, whether or not the condition exists or didn't exist, whether or not I said the condition exists or didn't exist, so kind of in a health uh, sensitivity kind of way. But this square is N11. So how many people are in this first box? This square is N12, so first row, second column. How many people are in that one? Uh, it's going to be N21 and N22 for that analysis. So what this formula does is it gives you the odds of N11 over N22, uh, excuse me, 212 divided by the odds of N21 over N22. So it's giving you an odds ratio of the first column to the second column, given that we also know the first column of the second row to the second column of the second row. So it kind of is a proportion out here. So it's giving you the ratio for row one to the ratio of row two. If you're wanting the ratios for the second row to the first row, switch your two um, uh, rows. So this essentially gives me the odds of the first row to the odds of the second row, given that they're already in proportions. That's how this one works. <clears throat> um, so it does matter what order you write them in. That's the important critical component of this. So that gave me the odds ratio uh, as 0.38. So the second row proportion wise is much more likely um, because the odds of the first row are not as likely. It gives me the standard error of those odds and then the confidence interval. So those com that confidence interval includes an odds ratio of zero, I'm sorry, one, one to one. So I don't know that I should um, be too confident in my results here. 
All right, the next thing down is it gives you eta. This is eta squared, r or r squared, or an uh, interclass correlation coefficient where you have the f values. So in this one, what we're going to enter is degrees of freedom model, degrees of freedom error. So DFEEM is degrees of freedom model. Sometimes this is called between subjects or variance or the numerator. Um, DFE is DF error or within subjects uh, denominator. Um, don't confuse that with the type of design, a between subjects design or within subjects design. Um, this is specifically about variance. Well, it isn't the variance itself, it's the de degrees of freedom for that variance rather. So I don't want to include variance here, that would be confusing. So the F part is the F ratio statistic. And then alpha and K. So let me scroll back down here. So DF numerator, DF denominator, F, alpha, and K. Okay. And then so it gives me my F statistic in APA style. It says what eta squared is, so 0.57 in this example, and my 95% confidence interval. There's a little warning here that if you have more than one IV and you're calculating these values, you should list this symbol as NP2 or partial eta squared. Um, so this will give you overall eta if you are calculating with one IV, multiple, uh, it gives you partial eta with multiple IVs. You can also use this to calculate R squared's uh, confidence interval for a linear regression model. Uh, for the entire model, we don't have anything quite yet for individual predictors. All right, last one I have is sort of like a prop test or proportions test. This is for independent proportions. Dependent proportions is a little bit trickier. Um, so right now all I have is independent proportions. Uh, be sure you list P1 and P2 as proportions and not percents or it will have a cow at you. So we're going to list those as proportions, proportion one, proportion two, number of people in group one, number of people in group two, alpha and decimals. That will actually calculate several things for you. It calculates the Z normal uh, statistic for each proportion. Okay. So there are several options for prop test uh, effect sizes. These are, these are a type of Cohen's D. Well, it's not Cohen's D at this point, but it's a type of, of D. Um, Cohen has one called H, I believe. But this one made the most sense to me. Um, there are Logit and Probit and several other versions that you can look up as well. But um, what it does is it calculates Z uh, for each one. It gives you the standard error and the confidence interval of Z uh, using a normal distribution calculates the second Z. So it's kind of a if this proportion is different from zero. So I didn't include the p-values for this, but it is actually a test whether or not that proportion is different for zero. And then it subtracts the two, calculates the uh, p-value of that difference, and then gives you Cohen's d as well. Um, so it tells you that in this particular case, they're not significantly different, um, but um, wait, the D is the perfect subtraction. This is the actual test on whether or not they're different, but we have a pretty large effect size here. And then here's my confidence interval for that effect size. So that whole thing is our brand new fancy version of moat that is uh, all in R for you to use. And if you spot any problems or get strange output uh, that is not one of these mornings, please let me know. Uh, you can contact me at my email, which is Aaron Buchanan at MissouriState.edu, or you can contact the lab email, BuchananLab at Gmail, or through YouTube, uh, and I respond when I'm not super swamped doing 100 committees. So I hope you enjoy, and let me know what you think.